Okay, so we're going to talk about the pelvic girdle, the integrated model of function and integrated systems model for disability, of disability and pain for my 632 presentation. We're going to start with the osteopathic approach. This is a, an approach founded by A.T. Still or Andrew Taylor Still. Um, he is the founder of the modern osteopathic medicine model. These are treatments that you'll see in manipulative therapy. Um, if you've ever gone to an osteopathic physician, these are different things that they may actually perform on you, different techniques they may perform on you. My personal physician is an osteopathic physician, so he and my wife goes to see the female in, in the practice. She also does these techniques on each other when we go. Muscle energy techniques, myofascial, cranial sacral, no viscerals as far as I know. So this charts approach is a little bit different than the treatments that we just saw. The treatments will come into play more later. This charts approach is how a true osteopathic physician, osteopathic minded uh, clinician will evaluate you based upon the chief complaint, history, symmetry, asymmetry, range of motion, tissue tension, and special tests. So these are things to keep in mind for the rest of the presentation. This osteopathic approach is in, I believe, chapter 9 of the low back book that we read for the class this semester. My presentation will focus more on Diane Lee. Diane Lee wrote, well, is a physiotherapist in Canada in Vancouver area. She specializes in the pelvic girdle and women's health issues. She's written multiple textbooks, including the pelvic girdle, the integration of clinical expertise and research. So this is the pelvic girdle book that uh, I read for the presentation. It's good 406 pages long. Um, most of my presentation will focus on this book and what goes into it with Diane Lee as the major author. And she also has a major contributor, Linda Joy Lee, who is a physiotherapist in her clinic as well. So, the integrated model of function. This is something new, right? This is something I've never seen before until I read Diane Lee's book. So, in the middle here, you see function. And then you see four different boxes, form closure, force closure, motor control, and emotions. Integrated model of function focuses on the evaluation of the function of the pelvis and how the pelvis efficiently or effectively transfers load across tasks with varying characteristics. Interesting. Okay, so this model really looks at how the pelvis handles load and transfers load across meaningful tasks, right? So that is something that Lee in her book uses all the time. Meaningful task. What is the meaningful task for the patient? Sorry about that. Development of the new model. So this model is developed from anatomical and biomechanical studies of the pelvis and her own clinical experience working with pelvic girdle patients. Focuses on the evaluation of the pelvis, how it transfers load across different tasks, right? Addresses why the pelvis is painful by identifying impairments in one of those four components, form or force closure, motor control, or motion. Maybe it's a combination of the two. This is in direct opposition of pathoanatomical models that seek to ID pain only by the generating sort structures. So if my knee hurts, I go to my knee and I palpate my knee. Okay, this is what this is. No, this is not what the integrated model of function is trying to show you. This model is trying to kind of classify you within one of these four different components by IDing impairments. I think it's a, it's a good model and I think it, it makes sense for what we see and do here in the DAT. The first part of the model is the form closure theory. So this is how joint structure, orientation, shape contribute to its potential mobility and ability to resist shear or translation when loading. There's something called the neutral zone. All right, so this is the range uh, where joints, capsule, or ligaments provide no resistance to movement. They freely translate. This was written by Punjabi in 1992 this is the article that I posted to first, not first class, that's our email here, to Tastrain um, for you guys to read. It's a relatively short article, and it talks more about the neutral zone and the different uh, 
intervertebral disc issues uh, and motion related to the neutral zone. Force closure theory, on the other hand, is a little different. So force closure theory is when extra forces are needed to keep the object in place. Okay, so extra forces increase articular compression and friction between the joint surfaces and increase joint stiffness. Interesting. So directly applied co-contraction of the muscles that cross a joint, indirectly applied, this could be co-contraction muscles that don't cross a joint. So we we'll go back to form closure theory here. Form closure theory, structure, orientation, shape, mobility, ability of a joint, this could influence mobility, right? Different things could influence mobility, swelling, adhesion, hypo or hypertonicity of muscle. So the hyper, hyper, hypotonicity of the muscle will be important with Diane Lee's work. With force closure theory, we notice extra forces are needed to keep the object in place. Okay, so extra forces increase this compression of friction between the joint surfaces and increase joint stiffness. So maybe hypertonicity of the muscle would allow this to happen. Motor control theory discusses or is our understanding how the central nervous system controls stability of the spine. Two different types of situations we have here, static situations and dynamic situations. In the static situation, I'm sitting in my chair, um, I'm moving back and forth right now in, in my office, co-contraction of my trunk muscles stiffen the spine to hopefully keep it in proper alignment. However, in dynamic situations, the central nervous system can choose strategies that use movement to dampen and control movement in addition to a stiffness strategy. Hodges and Kolwicki, I think that most of us have read their work. I've read their work in multiple different uh, multiple presentations for DAT. So a dynamic situation is typically what we see in athletics, see in our own clinical practices. Dynamic situation for me in a golf swing, since I don't necessarily work out, I'm not the crossfitter, or run, will be different than if Marcy's working out and doing her CrossFit stuff. If Jim, Marcy, or not, well, I guess Marcy, or Kat, or Lindsay are going on their run. Completely different. So my dynamic situation, you can evaluate that to a point with the SFMA, right? So our body, central nervous system, is choosing strategies that use movement in a dysfunctional pattern, but we may not know that. So that's the pathological anatomical model is when we look at, yep, the pelvic girdle hurts. It's got to be something with the SI joint, let's say. Let's do something with that. Versus, yeah, I think it's the SI joint, but what is dysfunctional? What is the dynamic issue? What is your meaningful task that this isn't working properly for? This goes along well with McGill's work that Marcy discussed and, and I've had last spring for a presentation. So different emotional states. I think that this is a big thing within the DAT that I've noticed recently. Um, fear avoidance is, is, I think, more and more common than we realize. So if a patient doesn't have the coping mechanisms to confront their system or symptoms, they learn to avoid activities. This can persist due to the fear of re-injury or underlying belief that they are unable to perform due to their, to their condition. We've all seen this, I believe, in a patient coming back after uh, anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. The, they, they have coping mechanisms to confront their systems. They, they, they can't do certain things that they used to do early in the rehab process. And then as they progress into the rehab process and are about to return back into the particular sport, they may have fear of re-injury. So we see that quite often right around the return to play time for post-op ACL. Can happen in other injuries as well. In me, my personal life, I hate flying. My fear is 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 crashing in a flight. It has nothing to do with with true, I guess, exercise. But my fear avoidance is I never flew. I tried to avoid flying until I was at uh, Slippery Rock and we flew to Italy for for something, for a class. That was my first flight. As I've gotten older and I fl have flown more, I have learned to cope with that and I have coping mechanisms such as reading a book. I can read a whole book on a cross-country flight and that's one of my coping me mechanisms to avoid my fear, let's say. Now if we hit turbulence, that's a whole other question. 
Lindsay and Danita, who I sat next to Danita on our flight home from the West Coast this year, I think we both flew pretty well. She probably had no idea I was not a good flyer. So fear avoidance, neural drive to muscles of the region reflect this fear. Muscles become hypertonic, resulting in excessive compression with the lumbopelvic hip complex, LPH, lumbopelvic hip complex. This is the force closure theory. If we're in fear, we're scared, we're, we're fearful of doing something, we tighten up. I'm on a flight, my hands are gripping the armrests. If my wife and I are flying together, I'm gripping her leg. I've gotten better though. I noticed when I first started flying, I would get off the flight and be very sore and tired, almost like Dom's effect, like I just worked out. Interesting, never really thought of that until I read this in Diane Lee's book about fear avoidance. So in the lumbopelvic hip region, we see that. The lumbopelvic hip region, LPH region complex, is really the driver for everything we do in life. Walking, running, sitting, lying, exercising, right? If we have uh, muscles that are hypertonic in this area, it can cause pain, cause peripheral or central sensitization of the nervous system. Interesting, so more central sensitization work in here. She references Butler's work quite often in, in her text. So I thought this was pretty interesting. The review I gave you on, on Tastrin is uh, the current state of evidence on fear avoidance and rehabilitation. I think it's a pretty good review article. So the next couple slides here, we'll go over lumbar issues, lumbar spine issues using form force closure theory and motor control dysfunction, motor control issues. So these are lumbar issues that we may see, lumbar dysfunctions with acute pain, with acute locked back, and with chronic pain. So these are different things that Diane Lee talks about that we could do, interventions that we could do to help these patients. With acute pain, usually gentle range of motion will be beneficial. Lumbar dysfunction with acute locked back, HVLA, she discusses high velocity, low amplitude thrusts a lot, pretty much for anything that is articular. A central snag may be important for uh, a mulligan technique that we could use. The SMWLM, so the one mulligan technique that I'm going to pull out Frank's uh, lower quarter book here that I have in my office that he talks about the spinal mobilizations with leg movement. I know you won't be able to see that that well, but we're pushing down on the affected side, L4, L5 usually, and the patient is moving their affected limb in <clears throat> to full flexion as far as they can, and the second person provides overpressure. The Mulligan 5 movement doesn't really have a better name, I guess you could say, is, and this is what I called it since when I took the Mulligan course, it is for painful flexion extension, side bending rotation, but it is when you push directly into the fifth uh, lumbar vertebrae and you have them do a motion that bothers them, the functional task, the meaningful task that bothers them. So lumbar dysfunction with chronic pain is a little different. Lumbar dysfunction with chronic pain, we want to release the overactive muscle. We can release the overactive muscle by PRT, PRRT, then we want to restore segmental stability for each joint of the lumbar spine, or each level, sorry, of the lumbar spine. Self snags will do that. Retraining of the SI, or the lumbar spine, is used by a 4x4 matrix. So you can see these are just different uh, models. We have Cook, we have some uh, Mulligan, we have some PRT, and, and some spiker work in here that you can treat out of multiple different paradigms for the specific injuries that pathologies, issues that your patients may have. With the pelvic girdle, stiff SI joints are typically seen. This could be a reduced neutral zone. It could be in response to hypertonicity or pregnancy. Most of the patients that we treat probably aren't pregnant, but that may happen. But we will treat patients with hypertonicity of the core, the lumbar spine muscles. So myofascial release or positional release to Muscle causing excessive compression and retraining of the pelvic muscles has been shown to be uh, helpful. So we could do what Spiker um, says in his positional release course this summer, position them in the proper way, release that, that hypertonic muscle, and then go from there. Work on retraining the pelvic girdle muscles. Diane Lee explains and, and describes her 
PRT work, positional release work, just like Spiker Day did. So there's a lot of D'Ambrosio and Spiker, but I'm, I'm glad we took that course this summer because it really connected the dots based upon what Lee had talked about in her book. Something else we'll see is acute locked SI joint, usually traumatic, very common in our population. She says to do an HVLA or even a mulligan technique, muscle energy technique. Now the muscle energy technique that I would use is looks like the Gainsland's test. So one cheek on, one cheek off the table, right? They bring one knee to their chest. You have somebody holding them on the table because they're probably not feeling like they're gonna stay on. And then with the leg that's off the table, I push down gently and I have that patient push up into me, you know, six seconds, about 20% of their strength. Typically, we can get a, 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 a release within the SI joint and the patient feels better. I typically try this three times on each leg and then I go from there. I learned that technique from Regis Tarosi, uh, the PT, and he does some spiker work now too when I was at Slippery Rock. With the hip, Pretty common in sight for excessive compression. Also, hypertensity of muscles causing pain elsewhere. So, with our musculature from the hip that originates on the hip, or even inserts on the hip, greater trochanter. Regional interdependence, this is screams regional interdependence. I have a tight piriformis. I have a tight piriformis, right? Excessive compression, I have a hypertonic piriformis causing pain elsewhere in my body. My... Yeah, let's leave it at that. She talks about positional release, release with awareness. So that's one technique, positional release with awareness. Release with awareness, I'll talk about later. In chapter seven of her book, she talks about clinical practice work. And this is very interesting. She says in here, pathoanatomical model is limited in several ways. Tissues heal, and yet the pain still persists. So only treating the painful tissue neglects other systems that could be dysfunctional, but pain-free. To resolve this pain, the pain-free but impaired structures need to be treated. This is, in a concept, in, in a way, regional interdependence. So to resolve the pain, but the pain-free but impaired structures need to be treated. How do we know what the impaired structures are? We do an evaluation. We do an evaluation of, by the SFMA. We do a, a normal orthopedic evaluation. And we can even pick a meaningful task for that patient. But once we find that impaired structure, we treat that. That is the regional interdependence. We do the breakouts with the SFMA. She talks a lot about classifying pain, and that is not technically for this presentation. I'm already probably going to run out of time, so I don't want to go into that more. I posted on Tastream an article by O'Sullivan that has a good description, good algorithmic uh, I guess flow charts on how they classify low back pain. Clinical prediction rules, again, I'm going to go through this quickly since we've had multiple classmates discuss this. You know, clinical expertise and clinical prediction rules, clinical decision rules. She says, Lee says in her books, to gain clinical expertise, you need skill acquisition and clinical reasoning. So you need to do the right thing at the right time. Throughout the DAT, I think that we are learning to do the right thing when and when the right time to do that is. With all the different intervention techniques we have learned, I think that we are on our way to be clinical experts in maybe mulligan, PRT, tapping, you know. Each one of us kind of uh, gravitated towards an area that we feel could be our clinical expertise. And I think that's part of the DAT. So both Flynn and Fritz for the clinical decision rules develop clinical prediction rules, clinical decision rules for interventions, low back pain. These are useful tools to assist in the clinical decision-making process, but as Lee states, individuals are not statistics. So I wrote down what Lee said out of her book. Averages tell us about the average response of the group defined by the characteristics used in the design of the study. Individual responses may be to a greater or lesser degree than average, or an opposite direction of the reported response. To me, what Lee is saying in her, her book that yes, clinical decision rules may be helpful, but you still need to have clinical expertise. You need to have that clinical reasoning to do what is right at the right time. But I thought that was kind of interesting. That's why I wanted to read it for you. So based upon all this information we've had gathered so far, Lee and Lee developed a new model for pain. Integrated systems model for disability and pain. This evolved from working with the integrated model of function. 
This allows clinicians to characterize all components that contribute to the whole body, or the flow of awareness, as she says. Melzack and Melzack talk about this within their gate control theory of pain back in 65, the new pain control theory, and a newer article in 2001. Flexibility to evaluate, integrate new evidence from research, and innovate clinical approaches as they emerge. That is a whole basis behind this technique. That is what we do in the DAT. That's why I put that in parentheses. We have the flexibility to evaluate and integrate new evidence from classmates, from articles, from research, and innovate, clin innovate clinical approaches as they emerge. We're innovating. We're bringing Mulligan to athletic trainers. That's our goal. That's one of my goals. I know that's Jim's goal. Danita's bringing emotional freedom technique, the tapping to us. Different things that I would not have been aware of before the DAT. Okay. This model is a patient-centered model. It can continually adapt to changing goals and values of the patient. It groups and classifies patients based upon primary form closure, force closure, motor control, or emotional deficit, but also the rest of the body and mind. The purpose of the model is to allow the patient to tell their story. You'll hear me say that over and over again. Tell their story. So this is a picture of the model. The little, the bottom of it gets cut off here, and that's not an issue. It just says Lee and Lee in 07 when they designed it. So you see the strategies for function and performance. You see the person in the middle of the, of the uh, diagram. And then you see four different components around the diagram. Neuro, visceral, myofascial, and articular. Within the, the center where the person is, you see goals, virtual body, story, emotions, and meaning. So the whole point of, of this is to develop, uh, to, to develop a good clinical listening skill, if you will, to listen to the patient's story. What meaningful tasks are they having issues with? And what is broken down within their function here, within their structure? So dysfunction in one are, say the articular function, the articular piece, may cause dysfunction in one or more other pieces. It can, it's not just an, if you have an articular issue, it's just not staying in the articular issue. So if I have a myofascial issue, that could affect my articular, neural, and visceral components of function and performance. So that is a regional interdependence model. The outer circle of the puzzle, here we go, represents strategies for function and performance that that patient currently uses for meaningful tasks, right? Which are determined from listening to that patient's story. Impairment of any piece of the outer circle can cause impairments and not optimal strategies. For living, for function, for performance. So each of these are articular conditions that Lee discusses in her book that we could see as clinicians. You know, ligament, capsular, fracture, issues, synovitis, apophysitis. I'm not gonna read you all, all, all of them, Treatments for each of these articular system issues. In her textbook, she discusses mulligan mobilizations with movement. For the hip, she says to do a lateral glide. There's a picture of her in the textbook doing a lateral glide with a belt. For the SI joint, it depends on which isn't moving properly. Is it rotated anteriorly or posteriorly? And then how do we do that? So you have to evaluate the patient. Lumbar spine, you might use a line snag. So you get your waiter, you push in, you have them drop their butt to their heels. HVLA, so high, yeah, HVLA, she discusses this with the hip. She says that is not indicated for treating the articular system. SI joint, she calls it a positional fault, which I thought was very interesting. I have a picture on the next slide of what she does. And then two slides from now, I have a picture of what she does for the SI joint. So some of this will get cut off, but you'll see it on the actual PowerPoint that I upload for you. The side joint here is this, uh, this is a high velocity, low amplitude thrust to the right with the right arm, right here, moving fast to distract the posterior aspect of the left, left SI joint. So this is left SI joint, right arm, left arm is stabilizing, and the patient is in a uh, sideline position. So it's a high velocity, quick movement. Very similar picture, this is for a lumbar spine. Lumbar spine, HVLA. So we distract the joint, and then you change your force to move the right arm fast and towards her. So she is distracting here, and then she will move her right arm and do a high velocity thrust towards her body. That is Diane Lee doing this uh, little picture here. So those are just two quick techniques that she discusses in her book. 
disability and pain for myofascial. So these are different myofascial issues that we could have. These are different neural conditions that we have. So she says in her book that you almost always have myofascial and neural components together. You can't have, you can have, sorry, you can have just neural, you can have just myofascial, but they work seamlessly together. So in her clinical expertise, she treats them as such. So you've seen myofascial, you've seen neural issues that we could have. She talks about positional release. So positional release, she describes the same as spiker, except for adding awareness. So PRT with associated with awareness. I have some slides coming up that will show you an example. Except it's the same thing. We get them in the appropriate position, just like spiker, just like the ambrosio would even talk about. But now we add a manual cue. So this release with awareness, once a reduction in tone is felt, you cue the patient to further release by letting go. You visually cue them of images that soften, melt, give way, or let go. As they're doing it, you give positive feedback, such as that's it, keep letting go just like that. Once maximum release is obtained, you take them passively through the full range of motion of that muscle joint, and you provide slight overpressure. A la Mulligan. I thought this was very interesting. We are now taking two different paradigms, a positional release and an articular, so mu muscle and a joint, we're combining them together. We are allowing that muscle to go through the full range of motion passively, right? And then adding a little bit of overpressure. So it is just like a Mulligan technique with PRT. So the example I gave you, she discusses this in her book. Piriformis muscle for the release of SI joint compression. So you pay, position the patient just like Spiker, but you add awareness. You maintain light pressure into the muscle and allow the patient to relax. So with her, what I've gathered, you actually do push a, a little lighter, I guess, compared to Spiker. Um, to me, you would push a little bit harder with Lee than Spiker. You allow the patient to relax. You tell the patient to imagine themselves relaxing that muscle. Let it go heavy. After the release, you lengthen the muscle, but continue to use the relaxation release and monitor muscle for hypertonicity. If you feel a hypertonicity forming, if the muscle is tightening back up, you go back into your positional release. Once the muscle is released, you take them through the end range of motion passively and then add overpressure. Then, a la TMR, you teach home exercises that reinforces what you learned what that patient has learned. So TMR does that. Mulligan does that. Almost every paradigm that we've learned does that. So the visceral system is interesting. Typically we see organ disease here, infections, inflammatory organ disease or pathology, endometriosis, ulcers, appendicitis. How are we going to treat that? Well, most of the time this may require medical intervention. However, treatment could include posture correction, or even dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, DNS. So Lee doesn't go that in depth into it. She says to refer these patients on to the appropriate medical personnel. She does discuss Jean-Pierre Barreau. That's my French. He's a DOPT. He developed the Barrel Institute, and I gave you the website right there. He, his videos are kind of difficult to understand. He's very French, very accenty, if that's a word. Curriculum is designed for assessment and treatment of visceral impairments. When I've watched some of the videos, it's, it, it's very similar to um, a PRRT technique, but you're doing less of this and more, I guess, just placing your hands on the patient. And like I said, it, it, he's very difficult to understand. I flew through a lot of this stuff. I wanted to be in in 30 minutes or less, and I, I, I may be doing that, I don't know, about 29 minutes, I think. My take-home message, you need to be well-versed in multiple paradigms. Before the DAT, I don't think many of us probably were versed in one paradigm, let alone multiple paradigms, for both evaluation and intervention techniques. Lee ties it all together with the pelvic girdle, but you can apply this to any other aspect of the body. I would have loved to have gotten in depth more in depth into the pelvic girdle evaluation, but I gave you the overall models, the two models that she developed, and then I brought in, I tried to bring in the different uh, paradigms that we have learned, 
have how you would treat some of these dysfunctional patterns, this, these issues that we, we typically see. Functional movement, right? Many of the evaluative techniques that, that, that she discusses are similar to the breakouts of the SFMA. And the neurological basis, central mechanisms in play? I think so. So the functional movement has been a common theme. Maybe I'm just looking at it through that lens that, that you know, myself, Marcy, Jim really seem to kind of looking like a Yonda, Cook, and some of these different things, Saruman. How does this affect the lumbopelvic hip region? Well, I gave you online access to the PDF version, I believe, of Chapter 8 in Diane Lee's book. It's, it's long. It's a PDF that you can download and read. It has all of her evaluative techniques in there. And I think if you, you know, glance through that, it, it is a longer read. You'll see that many of the movements and the, the evaluation techniques that she does look very similar to breakouts on the SFMA. So, to review, this presentation is literally just touching the surface. There's so much more I could get into, and, and maybe my manuscript will. So the understanding, the two things I wanted you to really get out of this presentation was understanding of the different models. Integrated models function, integrated systems model for disability and pain. Understand and appreciate how the multiple paradigms will allow the clinician to grow. She talks a lot about reflective clinical practice. So you have to be, uh, to become a clinical expert in a technique, in a paradigm in just athletic training in general, reflective clinical practice, listen to their story, meaningful task. With that in mind, you should be able to effectively treat a patient based upon what paradigm you want to treat in. So these are a few of my uh, references here, and then a bunch more of them here. So in closing, I think that the biggest thing I've learned from this presentation, and, and I've kind of had a couple patients here and there with some low back issues now, some athletic training students that it's fun treating in different paradigms. You know, this past week I treated one patient with the mulligan uh, movement, leg movement, uh, single, yeah, the SWM, LM, yeah, spinal mobilizations with leg movement. Then I treated another one with a muscle energy technique. I tried a HVLA according to our State Practice Act. It uh, shouldn't be an issue in Massachusetts. So I think the biggest thing, take home message again, be well versed and understand multiple paradigms. It will help you in the long run. Thanks.